Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, where we are going to take on the suggestion that living aboard a starship would be preferable to living aboard a modern-day nuclear submarine. David Redinger, a submarine veteran who commented on our very first episode regarding the starship overall design, shared his view of the living conditions aboard a 9-meter variant of the starship as being luxury quarters compared to his previous station aboard a nuclear sub. This is actually a very common comparison that people make when describing living conditions aboard a starship, but it apparently has no more thought put into it than when the angry astronaut made his rather embarrassingly incorrect comparison of the starship against the HMS Victory, thinking that the starship had much more room per traveler than Nelson's flagship did. So let's break down that comparison again, and then we'll compare both of them to a modern nuclear sub. The HMS Victory was just short of 70 meters long, about a stern. The Starship is 50 meters long, with 20 meters of that length being pressurized usable space, including the airlock deck. This gave the average British sailor aboard Victory twice the habitable space than the Starship colonists will enjoy. Sailor Rediger didn't mention which type of submarine he sailed on, but since the Los Angeles class subs are the most numerous in the US Navy, have been around for a while, and they aren't the most modern subs in the fleet, it's a fair guess. So how would that measure up? The HMS Victory is just short of 70 meters long from bow to stern with a crew of 800 men. The Starship is 50 meters long with 20 meters of that length as usable pressurized space, including the airlock. According to Musk, this is supposedly fit for 100 travelers headed to Mars. But the LA class sub? 110 meters long with a crew numbering 129 sailors and officers. So significantly larger than Starship with a similarly sized crew. In fact, you can easily put five Starship payload bays inside a single LA class sub. In this crosscut, if we take the beam and draft of the sub and compare it to the Starship and the Victory, it looks like this. The footprint of the crosscut is smaller than the Victory, but slightly taller than the Starship at 9.4 meters and wider with a 10 meter beam. Comparing the numbers from Starship and HMS Victory, the LA class subs conservatively have at least 7,800 cubic meters of interior volume and carry a crew of about 129 sailors and officers. So that gives each man a share of space, measuring about 60.5 cubic meters each. And yes, this calculation includes all the machinery and artillery and equipment, but on Starship it must also include similar types of reductions, because the Starship needs to be loaded down with everything the colonists or astronauts will need for their entire excursion. Every breath of air, every drop of water, every bite of food. They also have to hang on to every scrap of garbage, every used piece of tissue paper, and every drop of black water. And they need space to pack everything they plan on building or setting up on the surface of Mars. Subs don't have to haul all those materials along because the sailors aren't bringing their entire lives with them. Also, they're not planning on colonizing wherever it is they land. Submarines can make fresh water as necessary through their reverse osmosis desalinization plant, and therefore don't need to keep large reserves on hand as Starship will require. Subs can also dump their black water at open sea, and as organic materials, there's no issue with that. But Starship needs to collect, store, process, and recycle every drop of those liquids. When a submarine requires fresh air, it can either surface and cycle their tanks, or they have processors on board that can separate oxygen from seawater. If the Starship runs out of air, or you get tired of breathing in recycled farts, tough beans, you can't just roll down the window. So now would be a good time to remind everyone that the air on the ISS smells like prison, according to Commander Scott Kelly. A combination of antiseptic, rotten garbage, and body odor. And that's with half a dozen people not showering. On Starship, there's 16 times that number. Sailor Rediger stated med runs often last six months, but a sub can't stay submerged that long, not even a nuclear sub. Why not? Even as large and as advanced as these subs are, there's no escaping the limitations of groceries and the longest the sub stays underwater without reprovisioning is three months. Every 90 to 100 days maximum, the larders are refilled with fresh produce, meat, milk, eggs, and ship stores. Submariners, by the way, reportedly eat like kings, as David Rediger failed to mention. Best chow amongst all the services by all accounts. It is a perk provided by the Navy for those willing to volunteer for submarine duty. This particular article highlighted the dinner menu of prime rib, lobster, sautéed mushrooms, baked potatoes, and beef and rice soup with baskets of fresh baked bread, followed by creations of their pastry chef that included chocolate and lemon cakes that were also made fresh. Four such meals are on offer to sailors in a 24-hour rotation. Don't plan on the Martians eating anywhere near as well. Prepackaged individual servings of shelf-stabilized food warmed up with hot water 
will be the only items on the menu. There will be no fresh produce or grilled burgers or boiled lobster or even a buffet line. Every traveler will be rationed at every meal by necessity for the food they consume and even the amount of water they can use on a daily basis. Starship needs to stow away every calorie the traveler will need while on this excursion, and don't count on other supply vessels waiting on the surface with fresh supplies either. Anything sent ahead of time sitting on Mars's surface will be freezer burnt, irradiated, and almost certainly spoiled. As a point of fact, food supplies on the ISS have a shelf life of 12 months, or less than half the time between home and transfer orbits between Earth and Mars. With so many sailors in close quarters, dealing with heat is a major issue but it's easily dealt with aboard a sub. They use heat exchangers to cool off the interior air as needed. Spacecraft need to deal with this as well. Take the ISS for example. We've all seen the iconic silhouette of the ISS with its giant panel arrays. Most people think that all these panels are solar panels, but in fact the gray colored arrays that extend out from the ISS are giant heat radiator panels that dissipate heat from the interior space of the station. Heat produced by the human body, if allowed to build up in a closed system, can reach extreme, even fatal levels. Another consideration of building heat in a human system is that the warmer a person feels, the quicker they are to anger. And in an already stressful environment, flaring tempers could easily put the mission in jeopardy. And that's just considering the body heat in the equation. The ISS temperatures can vary 300 degrees from side to side, according to which side is facing the sun. Typical temperatures on the station are 121 degrees Celsius in the sun and negative 157 degrees Celsius in the shade. The Starship will have a crew potentially 16 times larger than the ISS and will also be constantly exposed to the sun. So where are the heat exchange panels in these diagrams? While we are discussing differences between the two vehicles, let's delve into some of the other psychological and sociological differences and challenges between the crews. In a military structure, such as governs a submarine crew, you have tiers of officers directing the actions of the crew. Sailors who join submarine crews volunteer for that particular duty and they must have gone through proper training to become eligible. They also undergo psychological screening to make sure that they will be okay in tight confined spaces for a long period of time. If you have the time, this presentation regarding the psychological screening process undertaken by the military to stem the 40% attrition rate in first deployment sailors is definitely worth a read. Military service is a rigid social structure, complete with rewards for exemplary service and punishments for disobeying orders. Modern subs no longer have brigs, but a sailor who breaks the rules could be held in custody anywhere on the ship until they can be debarked and face court-martial ashore, as determined by the captain and enforced by the cob or the chief of the boat. The bedrock of military law is the Uniform Code of Military Justice, a system that allows for swift and sometimes brutal punishments. An attempted mutineer aboard any naval vessel, as an example, may still be put to death if so determined by the panel overseeing his court-martial under Article 94 of the UCMJ. Every sailor working on a submarine has a job to do, a structure of command to follow, and rules that will be enforced as necessary. The sailors are physically fit, psychologically sound, and will be quickly weeded out if they don't happen to fit into the crew's social structure. But Musk is under the impression that he'll be taking anybody who wants to go to Mars as long as they're willing to pay the ticket fare, reportedly around $200,000. This paradigm would result in an untrained mishmash of society with differing levels of physical and mental fitness, ego, and self-entitlement. Such a system would almost certainly be nearly impossible to regulate. More likely, this will require a similar societal structure as the sub, or a paramilitary structure similar to cruise ships or airplanes, with officers in charge, crew carrying out their orders, and travelers required to follow their instructions. Even on cruise ships, the captain's orders stand, and lawbreakers are dealt with on the ship and restricted to quarters or the brig until they can be handed over to authorities at the next port of call. How ironic is it that civilian cruise ships have brigs, but submarines, as vessels of war, do not. The physical isolation of the two vessels will be on completely different scales, presenting many different types of challenges. For example, a submarine in distress would be responded to immediately by other ships in the vicinity, or possibly by a rescue chopper. Submarines are usually never more than a week away from safe harbor if needed, and can normally surface when injured to travel quicker. Any starship en route to Mars is beyond assistance the instant they leave Earth orbit. 
If they malfunction and drift off course or suffer any failure whatsoever, the crew will be pretty much lost in space. Then there's the psychological impact of watching the Earth disappear in a rearview mirror with the crew knowing they cannot stop and turn around even if they change their mind. And keeping in touch with people back home is going to grow more and more difficult the further away they get from Earth. Now let's compare the reality of life aboard a 110 meter sub to the fantasy of living in a 20 meter high pressurized capsule of a starship. Take a tour through the sub and the main access from bow to stern is a primary access corridor. Racks, which are the personal bunks of sailors, are small, as David the sailor mentioned, but the men are not restricted to this space for the majority of the day. They have duty stations and jobs to perform and drills to fill their day as well. This activity negates the need for a full deck of dedicated workout space, as will be required on Starship to mitigate the effects of weightlessness. All sailors on this ship have open access to all areas of the ship at all times, no restrictions. So if a sailor wants to go for a 200 meter walk in his spare time, he can do so just by walking from one end of the ship to the other end back. Once again, this vehicle is over five times the interior volume of the Starship habitable compartment, with a similar crew complement, and you'll notice how tight everything is for the crew and everything they need for a maximum of three months at sea. Every usable cubic centimeter of the submarine is storage for something. Whether it's food, supplies, tools, emergency gear, personal effects, very little wasted space. When ship stores are replenished, all the meat goes in the freezer and every other nook and cranny on a sub is stuffed with food supplies. Yet in the animations on YouTube for Starship, you see giant atrium windows extending three decks high, acting as a backdrop for violin concertos. Tell us, once she stops playing, how's she supposed to get back down? Besides, isn't that the location of the LOX header tank? How about these depictions of an entire deck of lounge chairs? What's the function of these chairs? Is this where you're meant to sit for the next six to nine months watching old Netflix reruns while eating Ichiban noodles? When it comes right down to it, Musk has never released interior schematics, which is why we've been waiting since October for an update from SpaceX about this machine. Artist concepts are all anyone has been going by, but we guarantee that if travelers are given the choice between violin concerts and bringing along another 10 tons of water or food or solar panels or toilet paper, they won't be booking the violinist. Every nook and cranny of the Starship should be loaded down with the supplies that travelers will need. There should be absolutely no wasted space. Unfortunately, if they do that, it's unlikely the Starship will be able to carry all of it anyway. If we ever get that overdue update, maybe we'll finally be able to see what the ship is supposed to look like on the inside, how many people it's actually going to carry, how many refueling flights they expect it will need, and how the hell a giant cigar tube with no extendable legs is supposed to land upright in an uneven field of talcum powder. Thanks for watching this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. We'd like to thank our viewers for their continued support and give a special shout out to our new Patreon patrons, Suni Nazami, Duarte Santos, Alexander Vasilenko, and David. Thank you very much for your direct patronage. Please remember to give the video a like, share it with your friends, and hit subscribe so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.